Good morning, everyone. So good to see this group here together this morning, uh, fellow plant lovers and uh, garden lovers, enthusiasts. Uh, just a good experience. We welcome you to our April uh, Tuesdays with uh, lecture series sponsored by the Friends of the Georgetown Library. My name is Bob Willey, and I have the privilege of serving as the president of the Friends of the Georgetown Library. It really is a privilege with a great library and a terrific staff and great resources that we provide here for, that they provide here for the Georgetown community. Tuesdays with, as many of you already know because you've been here on other occasions, uh, is uh, named after a 1997 bestseller, Tuesdays with Maury, which was a great uh, book talking about the ongoing relationship between a college professor and a college student that went well beyond the 18 to 21 year old age group into the adult years. And that's exactly what this program is all about, providing continuing education opportunities for adults as we continue in our lives, always learning. And today is a good learning experience as we have Tuesdays with Tim and Zenobia, uh, a great opportunity to be able to learn more about raising a Gullah garden. We have two experts today, and I'd like to introduce them a little bit, although I have a feeling I'd have to introduce myself more than the two of them uh, with this group. I won't do that, but I'll talk about them. Zenobia is founder of the Gullah Preservation Society, an artist in residence with the South Carolina Arts Commission with her arts featured in numerous galleries and many private collections. She's currently serving as a community outreach coordinator for the Joyner Institute of Coastal Carolina University, which is keeping her very, very busy these days. Local gardener, her expertise, and if you want to see her handiwork, stop by the garden at the Arnett next door to the Arnett AME Church. Beautiful community garden that's there in process. Probably the best way to put it right now. <laughs> no, it's in process, but it's a wonderful outreach to the community working with all age groups and particularly children, which is wonderful. Tim is one of the first people that Carol and I met when we moved to Georgetown uh, in his capacity as the mosquito control coordinator. And my wife goes up to him when we first meet him and said, you are my favorite person in Georgetown. <laughs> Anybody who wipes out mosquitoes was her favorite. And I said, wait a minute, where do I fit in this? And I was told I was second. <laughs> uh, moved on to terrific job as director of uh, Georgetown Public Works Department. Uh, and then retired, ha ha, uh, <laughs> as we do um, smart garden consultant, master gardener, and he's on the board of uh, directors of Keep Georgetown Beautiful, and a founding member of the Seed Library here at the library. Join me in welcoming Zenobia and Tim today. Here you go, Tim. I'll give you this for... There you are. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, just got some more props. These are also giveaways in these bags if somebody wants them. Uh, but I might have to warn you <laughs> that these are the different soil types that we have in this area. And one of them, if you have in your yard, I don't have to tell you what it is. It is clay. So. Uh, uh, no, I'm fine. I'm fine. Uh, what we're going to do today, we're going to tell you, I'm going to tell you how you can grow that garden here in the low country. And so nobody's going to come back and tell you the history of these gardens. These gardens were very important to the people here in the low country. They were a necessity. Uh, like Bob said, I know most of everybody in the room. I do see a couple faces I don't recognize. Uh, a little bit about me. I've lived here, was born and lived here all my life here in Georgetown. I left to go in the Air Force for a few years and I came right back to the place that I love. Uh, my dad, the little history we know on him, he was born and raised on Cat Island. We know that today as Yawkey Plantation. Uh, and we're still trying to dig in and get some more information on him. Uh, my mother's family, which was easy to trace, she was born and raised in Tibwin, a small community in McClellanville, just 23 miles south of here. 
Uh, she was raised along with seven siblings on a small farm. So that's where my love for gardening came from. Uh, she was in school in Mount Pleasant. Schools went to 11th grade. Howard High started a senior year, and her and her sister were sent to Georgetown to live with a distant relative so that they could attend school and get that 12th grade and get their high school diploma. Needless to say, her and my dad met. They courted, married, and me and four other siblings were raised here in the city of Georgetown. But my life was always spent between Georgetown and McClellanville doing whatever needed to be done on that farm. Like I say, these farms were a necessity. We were told to go out in those fields or in those backyard gardens. We were told what to do. We did not have a choice. <laughs> we had to do it because that's how we ate. Now, we got to be real. With those of you who have grown up just like me, gardening and farming was hard work. It was very hard. And most of us, most people my age and maybe a little older, we swore that if we ever got off of those <laughs> farms, we would never return to this kind of work. But it's funny how when those gardens no longer are a necessity, and you just do it because you love doing it. And my mom had a passion for it, and out of all my siblings, I think she put more of it on me. Uh, i tell you one story. It was uh, coming close to Good Friday here in Georgetown. And as you gardeners know here in the low country, Good Friday is our holiday. That's when we're looking to put plants in the ground. Why Good Friday? Because hopefully all threats of frost have passed by. Uh, not so in this new climate that we're living in. Sometimes we get frost on Easter morning. But she could not get her, the guy to come and plow her, her garden. This man plowed it with a mule and a plow. Uh, not very big, probably half the size of this library, which was considered a small plot. But he couldn't make it because he had so many other gardens to plow, and she was just pacing back and forth. So the teenager and me got up that Saturday morning. I took a spade shovel, and I went out in that field, and I stayed in it all day long, turning that soil with a spade shovel. Now, I had help. I let the chickens out. And as I would turn a shovel, the chickens would scratch it and get the worms. So we had a good team effort going on that day. And, and later that evening, my mom came, made me go in the house to wash up, get something to eat. And I had the best reward. There was a whole pan of cornbread just for me. <laughs> but needless to say, that's how I fell in love. The gardening bug bit me. I did not dread the work because I loved every minute of it. Uh, and I've been planting all my life. No matter where I was in the world, I've always tried to plant a garden or get out to the garden. I planted gardens in Japan, the Philippines, Utah, Illinois. I even tried one in Alaska. And these were the different places the Air Force uh, took me. Uh, different climate, different plants that they grow. And I wanted to see how people would grow things in different areas. Now, gardening and farming is still hard work. But I like to call myself a smart gardener because over the years I've found some neat little tricks that'll spare you all this hard work. Uh, these specimens you see came out of my garden yesterday. I wanted to show you that even though folks are still waiting on Good Friday, if I waited till Good Friday, I would not eat. And in this coastal climate, you should have something growing in your garden year long. Most vegetables we grow twice a season. Uh, I didn't feel like picking the sweet peas because I figured I was going to have to pick a lot and Carol would probably take the whole batch. <laughs> but I do have peas already on the bush ready to be picked. 
When do you plant, Tim? These things were put down in January and February. Beets are just now starting to come. They were out in February. Onions, sweet onions, believe it or not, they went in the ground. Some went in the ground in November, the week of Thanksgiving. Why? Because they are short day onion. And there is a difference. There's a short day, long day. And now we even call one an intermediate day onion. Haven't experienced that one yet, but I am going to try. But depending on the type depends on when you should put it in the ground. Now, like I said, in these bags, uh, I'm going to show you the three types of soil that we got in this area. And for you folks from the north, <laughs> I feel your pain. Growing in the north was easier than growing here in the low country because your soils, you are blessed with good soils in the north. Here in the low country, our soils are horrible because they need nourishing constantly. I've got a bag here. Oh, this little floret Zenobia. Oh, I actually went in Harris Teeter in, in uh, Charlotte last Sunday. Okay. Put another leaf on that, and that's what they were selling as collards. Are you kidding me? 339. <laughs> <laughs> 3 dollars and they called it organic. <laughs> but if you're gardening here in the low country, I guarantee you some of you are going to have sand in your garden. What does it look, look like? That's what it looks like. That's what's in your yard. Problem with that is water will run right off of it. It will not hold uh, moisture or nutrients very well. But you can amend any soil you have in your yard to make it something good. But that is sandy soil. And can you grow in that? Yes, you can. But you're going to have to work with that. Some of you have what we call a loam soil. Loam is the same as what you might call a rich black topsoil. And a lot of folks said, Tim, that's what I got in my yard. I ought to be able to grow anything. But I'm not. The problem with loam, loam will hold some organic material. It's right under your lawn. You dig your lawn up, you're going to have topsoil under there. So you know that it can grow. But what happens to it when it's wet? It clumps. And those little seedlings, those little hair roots, can't penetrate that topsoil, and that's why you, you don't grow, or it's harder to grow. And then, <laughs> some of you have this in your yard. How does it look? It, it actually breaks down into something different. But would it hold water? <laughs> yes, it will. <laughs> it'll hold water for days. It'll even hold some nutrients. But when it dries, you've got a nice brick right here. And it's hard to get plants' roots to penetrate through that. And then what we have here is what we now have in Zenobia's garden. <laughs> That's what she has in her garden. Now, did she start out that way? She actually started with all three of these, is what she had. Uh, they called it, the, uh, the USDA lady called it a Yamasee soil. And the Yamasee soil was what was mostly in this area. And I looked on the map, steel mill and historic district, all this is included in that range. So that's what you have, a Yamasee soil. Couldn't find any research why it was called Yamasee. I know there's a Yamasee River, but uh, maybe it's because you have all three of these types. So we had, you've been gardening now on that site. This is your fourth spring season. It took us two seasons to get from all three of those to this. And how did we do this? Well, Zenobia's putting down cardboard. 
uh, smothering roots. She's brought in leaves. Uh, I was actually with the city, so I know they got to trim these oak trees. They take this stuff out to the county landfill. So I say, hey, guys, let me save you a trip. Could you dump a load at Arnett Church? And we use that in between the rows. Weed suppression, but still we enrich that soil. And it broke down real fast. I'm talking four or five months. It was gone. And now her soil is a nice loose soil. Now, how do you get a good planting mix? Composting. How many of you got a bunch of oak trees on your property? How many of you are burning or throwing that leaf away? Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, if you've just got tons of leaves, you can only keep so much. But if you're going to do a garden, a small garden, and whether you're going to garden in ground or in containers, uh, I prefer the raised bed method, which is similar to what the Gullah people or the low country planters actually did. Those gardens had to be raised up on hills. They didn't call them raised bed back then, but they were put up on hills. Why? Because you've been here a while and we do get rain. When we get it, we might get four or five inches in minutes. That depletes the soil of all the energy and, and, and nutrients. It also floods everything too. So if you got that down on the ground, and we're called the low country for a reason. We are pretty flat. Then your garden floods out. So they learned that they had to raise those hills or beds up just for the drainage. They didn't really know that they were maintaining that moisture in there. They just know they were preventing replanting from flooding. So that's what you do if you're in the ground. If you're in a container, then you don't have to worry so much about good soil because you can go to the store and buy good soil. And you can buy it and, and, and read those labels. Beware that this pink bag is no different than this yellow bag over here. It's just that one costs more and one costs less. Uh, and that's another class that we do later on, showing you what those different bag soils is and how you can make your own. But if you're in containers, you can actually grow these same. I grow them in containers. Now, these actually came out of the ground. But for years, I've grown collards for the house. They're grown in my yard in containers so that my wife can go out. No, Bev, that hasn't happened yet. She <laughs> sends me out. <laughs> and I go out and I cut them and bring them in the house. But that's just so I can keep things handy. My garden is actually blocks away from the house. So I want to have stuff there if I need it. But you can grow these in containers. Uh, I would probably put two of these in one big pot. Broccoli, I've done as many as six in a big pot. And I've had beautiful broccoli. Uh, cabbage, he wants room. Put that cabbage one to a pot very center, and it will blossom out. Uh, we did a 26 pounder one year in a pot. Because I wanted to see how big we can grow one. Do I need a 26 pound head of cabbage? No, I don't. <laughs> but once I saw what it took to grow one that large, then I knew how to grow 12 of them a normal size. Uh, at trip to Charlotte last week, I bought a cabbage, Harris Teeter. I paid $9 for a cabbage. Oh now, I didn't know that's what it cost until my daughter, who was paying for the groceries, said, Daddy, you know how much you paid for this cabbage? $9. Well, they said it was organic. <laughs> but $9, and it was probably two, two and a half pounds. But you can grow your own, people. Um, I can prove to you you can grow your own. You don't have to grow everything uh, that Gay actually grows at her garden. She's got a beautiful farm, really. She's even got citrus out there. She's got everything. 
Her plot is not even half the size of this room. And she gardens year round. She can produce enough for her household. You can too. Doesn't take a lot, maybe a few pots. If that's all the space you've got, a few pots will do it. We're going to take probably the worst one that's in the bag. Like I said, if you got clay, <laughs> you've got some problems, I could tell you that. But if it's in your garden, you can transfer. I know people that find clay and they'll go and dig it out of their garden. And to me, that didn't make sense. Say, it's already there. Now you're going to have to haul in, and that's what they want to do. They want to haul in enough soil to make the garden. When you already had your base, you can transform this thing. This compost actually came out of my compost bin. Also, along with, you know, you get those flower pots from year after year, and you, the plants die, and you throw that away, and you go fill it up with more. Take that soil and put it in your compost bin. Unless you had an issue with the plant. It either died from a disease or you had uh, a lot of weeds in it. You got them outdoor, and birds, I mean, the birds will plant the weeds in it for you. But if you get a situation like that, then maybe you want to toss that soil. But if not, use that soil to build compost. It's already got your perlite and vermiculite in it. And really, you don't even have to replenish it. I've got some pots been going for four years. I just replenish the top, get it in there loosen. But then again, I don't buy a lot of potting soil because I've learned I can make my own. It takes a little time to get the peat moss. Uh, instead of buy those bags of, of potting soil, I go and get, you see that big block of peat moss? Yeah. I go and buy that. And all the peat is going to do is lighten your loamy soil. It's going to lighten it up where it can be loose. So play around with, with some of that if you got time. But we're going to take that, I did what, three handful of clay? Let's do two, see what we got going. We're going to try to turn this clay into something that we can use. And we only did a two to, two to three. I can probably grow something in that. I, I know I can grow something in that. We're transforming that clay. And you see how it gets a little darker, gets a little richer as we go along. And this doesn't all have to be done right away at one time. You, you, you do seasons. And what we call a season, this is the spring planting season. We're going to get into the fall planting season. Uh, it starts in August. But you said, my God, August, it's still 98 degrees out there in the summer. Yes, it is hot. So you got to know where to put plants, how to put plants out as well. But you can see how quick we took that clay and made it something usable. Sand. We can do the same, same thing with sand. I'm going to do a one-to-one. -one. And some of you who've been to one of my gardening classes, you've seen this demonstration before. You thought it was magic. <laughs> it is pretty cool, though. We're going to do a two to one. That's two to one. And, and you play around, get the ratio. And if that's all I had to put in there, Come to fall, I'd be adding more. And I'd get that soil to where I want it to be. Uh, what I always tell people when I'm planting in the spring garden, I'm actually getting ready for the fall. 
And that, that's how I look at things in gardening. I'm getting ready for the next season. I'm always getting ready for the next season. A question came up on lime. Should I lime? Well, do your Clemson soil test? That test will tell you exactly what you need to put in that garden. Do I have to wire butt liming in a pot? No, I do not. Chances are that area is going to be what you need with the soils. Uh, fertilizing is a question we have. Understand fertilizer, what it means, what those three numbers mean. Nitrogen, uh, phosphorus, potassium, the NPK. Uh, that's what they mean. So when you see that 10, 10, 10 or that 14, 0, 7, whatever it is, it's explaining those nutrients within that package. A 100-pound bag of 10, 10, 10 fertilizer, 10, 10 pounds of that is nitrogen, 10 pounds phosphorus, the other 10 is potassium. The plants need nutrients. They need it at certain stages in their growth. Uh, nitrogen is mostly to green things up, get it that good jump. Phosphorus is going to help strengthen it. Potassium is going to help with fruit production. Uh, you can get into the organic versus uh, synthetic fertilizer. It just means you're going to use this plant that's probably been started with organic seeds. Uh, the type of fertilizers used to grow it was organic fertilizers. Uh, if I'm trying to feed a family, I got to do a lot. I got to make a lot. I got to produce. You can produce well with organic fertilizers. Uh, and again, when you're composting, you're actually putting organic stuff on those plants. When you're taking your kitchen scraps and putting it on that pile and you're breaking it down, uh, cardboard, newspapers, well, we don't get a lot of newspapers anymore, but all that is breaking down. It's nitrogen. That newspaper is nitrogen. Cardboard is carbon. You're going to put some organic stuff on it, so it depends on how much organic you want to be. Uh, I use very little fertilizers in my garden. Once I learned the secret of composting, I've started using way less fertilizer than most people do. And I can produce, I can produce, I'll produce some small farmers on that small plot that I have. Because I know how to rotate, uh, when to rotate. All these things I learned from my mother, they're not new. They're not new to me. I learned from her, well, mom, we're going to put the corn over here. No, son, we're going to put the corn over there this year. And that watermelon is going over there. And I was silly enough to ask why, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that's all I got to show you how to garden in the low country. Any questions right quick for Zenobia comes and hit you up with some history? Yes, ma'am. To me, the oak leaves are more beneficial because they're going to add more nutrients. Now, the pine straw, it's a decorative thing. Uh, and you'll see them on those flower beds. But uh, it does increase the pH in that soil. And those plants you're going to see in that flower bed is mostly going to be your azaleas and things like that that actually wants that higher pH. Uh, I would put them around my blueberries because they want a higher pH. Uh, and this thing with the volcano around the pine trees, you see it, <laughs> you're going to kill a tree. You actually can kill that tree, volcanoing that leaf around it. It smothers the tree. The tree is getting its oxygen at that flare. So when you build that mound of leaf, and, and I know why a lot of people do it. I know why my people did it. These leaves are falling. I'm going to wait till they all fall. So in the meantime, Bank them around that tree. But they also didn't save it back then either. Yes, ma'am. Do you have a favorite pest control? Uh, my favorite pest control is uh, BT, <coughs> Bacillus thuringiensis. Say that three times. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a natural enzyme. 
and what it does for, uh, I know what it does for cabbage loafers, cabbage worms, most insects, but what it does for those insects, they ingest it, and then they, it gets in their gut, and they explode. First they stop feeding, then they explode. But uh, you won't see that. You don't see them. <laughs> I was doing a talk on mosquitoes with some elementary kids in Andrews. And I used to employ mosquito fish. I would get them out of roadside ditches, little ponds. The mosquito fish will eat larvae. That's all it wants. And it will feed on mosquito larvae. And you don't have to use pesticide. Well, I had them in a five-gallon bucket, and the kids were just amazed. These little gambusia fish do live birth. Oh, we got babies! And then she turned around and started eating them. <laughs> oh! <laughs> little kids screaming going down the hall. <laughs> But, but if I had to use a favorite, that is my go-to pesticide. Uh, now, I do get some stuff like you get uh, potato beetle on your, uh, bean, on your potatoes, but mostly they get on your beans. They get on your green beans. It's called a Colorado bean beetle. Looks like a ladybug. There's nothing lady-like with this bug. It will just sit and you can almost hear it chewing. But uh, I may go to something a little stronger there. Uh, most of the time, I'm going to pick an insect off. It's easy for me to do that. If I've got a row of 12 cabbage plants, and they're beautiful, and I've got cabbage worms just destroying one, I'll actually hold off before I spray anything. You know, I'll forfeit that one. I got 11 here that I'm going to eat. So I try not to spray a lot of stuff, but that BT, uh, you can find it in most stores, mixes with water, you spray it, it's a natural enzyme. Uh, our bodies actually make some of it, but uh, you don't have to worry about waiting for the next rainfall to wash it off your plants. You can actually spray it, you can crop that plant next day or that evening if you want a mess of collards. So that is a good one to use. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, do I have to turn it on? Yeah, oh, am I good? good? She's already on. Oh, am I, do I have to turn it on or anything? Yay. <laughs> um, so my husband and I, about in 2018, we started a organization called the Gullah Preservation Society of Georgetown, South Carolina, Inc. And the purpose is the promotion and preservation of Gullah culture, language, um, and the people of Georgetown, South Carolina. And that's very important to us because oftentimes Georgetown is kind of overlooked or we're kind of clumped in with the rest of the, the corridor. But Georgetown County has its own distinct and unique Gullah culture. This was the seat of rice production. Georgetown County was the seat of rice production. So while the wealth and banking and all of those things were done in Charleston, this was the area where tons and tons of the crop that created the immense wealth was grown. So I think that we, not that I'm mad with Charleston or any of those other places, but we have a standalone um, culture. And I think that it's important for people to know that. So um, we were busy doing that in more artistic ways. Um, uh, the preservation of culture until the pandemic. So when the pandemic hit, we the garden, the GPS garden, or the Georgia, or the community garden was a way to pivot, so that we could still, you know, do the work that we were doing, but be outside and so on and so forth. Um, so when I started the garden, my thought was that we would um, plant some of it, and then the community would come and they would plant some of it. It hasn't really worked out like that. Um, yet, but because it hadn't worked out like that, 
the garden has become my peaceful place because I'm out there every single day. It's my peaceful place. It's where I go to commune with God. It's where I go to make sense of things. It's way where I go to work my body out. It's just been a wonderful place for me. Um, we do have somebody this year who's asked for a, 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 a bed. Uh, she's trying to stop drinking. She's trying to stop drinking. And so she feels like going out into the garden will help her. So I think that's a beautiful thing. And for that kind of to evolve organically like that, I think it's better than you know trying to say, well, pay twenty-five dollars for a plot and do this or that. Um, so it's it'll be it'll organically become what it's going to become. Um, so we started the garden with this with these things in mind to introduce young people to the historical crops that were grown by our West African ancestors. So Gullah Geechee people, for those of you who may not know, we are the descendants of those enslaved Africans that were trafficked to this area for the purposes of predominantly rice production. And so those crops that came along with them. Um, we, I wanted young people to be able to see that. So oftentimes when we, well all the time, when we're talking about groups of people where they come from and the foods, we associate them together. So Chinese food, Japanese food, Mexican food, Spanish food, French food, we put the two together. But particularly with African food, we just, we just don't really talk about that. Um, because of the institution of slavery, many people were separated from their history. Um, they were separated from their culture, and food is a part of that. And so very seldom did I grow up hearing about the things that Africans came with. It's almost as though they were birthed on the water with no, with no, no context or nothing to go back to. Um, but things like okra, okra is African. Um, all of the peas in the Black Eyed Peas family, uh, Crowder peas, um, uh, uh, purple hull peas, which is a big, uh, my husband is a big fan of. All of those things are African. Some okras are African. Sorghum is African. I plant sugarcane in my garden, not necessarily because it's African, but it's the reason why tons of enslaved Africans were moved around was for sugarcane and rum. So um, I also plant or try, attempt to plant rice in, in the garden. Um, sometimes it grows and sometimes it doesn't. If I can get just enough for kids to see, um, things like hibiscus, all of those things have indigo, all of those things have African roots. So I think that it is important for us to be able to reconnect the um, descendants back to where, uh, to their origins and their roots. And so for them to understand that there's a place from which we come from, just like everybody has a place that they come from, there is a place that we come from. Um, we also wanted uh, young people to have the opportunity to experience the care needed to grow food. Our kids don't, and I can't even say our kids, I mean, even older people, we don't have a clue where food really comes from. We really don't have a, they really think it comes out of a bag. They really think it comes out of a can. They really think that because we, we don't, you know. So for them to be able to see uh, a long bean that grows uh, 12 inches long or more, or to be able to see how an eggplant hangs off of an eggplant bush, it really is amazing. It was, it's amazing to me. Um, uh, sunflowers, we plant a lot of sunflowers, and I keep doubling the amount of sunflowers that I grow every year just to stay in solidarity with the Ukraine. That's their, their flower. So I can't do nothing about the war, but I can, when you ride by the garden and you see all those sunflowers, you viva la Ukraine, you know, that whole thing. <laughs> but it's a wonderful flower to teach abundance. I mean, you, you plant one sunflower, you get 400 seeds. You can get 400 seeds in one you know, in one place. And it also is one of those things that I learned, Tim, that helps to remove toxins from the soil. So if you plant, you know, they're using it to remove radiation uh, around Chernobyl and places like that. So it really does have a function. It does move to remove toxins from the soil. Um, so we really want kids to be able to see the food as it's growing, connect them to that so that if, if they grow in tomatoes, they'll eat tomatoes. If they grow in broccoli, they'll eat broccoli. If they grow in kale, they'll, they'll, they'll eat it. They'll try it. Um, we also wanted to create a living example of the importance of community connection to the land, which is one of the thing that, things that we are missing. Um, a lot of the properties uh, in 
my uh, family are owned as heirs property, which is this communal way of owning property. Uh, so all of the heirs of the property own it together communally. We are losing a lot of land because of that. The land that we plant on by um, Arnett Church is heirs property land. It doesn't belong to my family, but it belongs to uh, another family. And I think, I thought that it was important. Memron Road is a well-traveled road. You can see what we're doing from the road. And you can also see things that could be done with your property that you can do together. You, you don't have to fight over it or lose it or have this have it be this point of contention. Figure out something that you can do on this communally owned land to make it perk, to make it produce, to make it grow things. So we want to be a living example of that without constantly having to say, this is what you should do. If you're watching what we're doing, we're, we're leading by example and not just talking. Um, and we also wanted to create a living example of community uh, cooperation and unity, okay? Um, I was blessed to have Tim Chapman as my master gardener, um, but I, it was important for me. I, I went to ask him about being my master gardener, but at the time his daughter had gotten into an accident. And so I was like, oh Lord, I can't ask the man to be my master gardener because he's got family issues and so on and so forth. But then he came to me and he was like, what you doing? I'm like, I'm planting this garden. And he literally connected himself to the, to the effort. It's important for me for people to understand, especially as, the, uh, as this area is changing, people are coming in, that we have the expertise that we need in this community. We have the expertise. He is a master gardener, um, more importantly, because his mom was a master gardener, not because of the Clemson certificate that he has. That's a plus. But he became a master gardener because he was raised up under a master gardener. And so now when we are talking about gardening, we're not just talking about soil and all of the things that he talked about today, but we are talking about the historical value of the way we did things and why we did things. So historically, we talked the other day about the fact that there was always a stand of garlic in people's yards. And I'm younger than Tim. Not by that much, but I am younger than Tim. <laughs> and so I, I had to think about it, and I was like, well, we didn't really flavor that much with garlic. But garlic was, uh, there was a stand of garlic in every Gullah garden because of healing. It was medicinal. And so people would put those stands of garlic. There are elderberry trees all along in Gullah communities, in the community where Arnett is. That was medicine. People were conscious and they were deliberate about the things that they were putting in their space, especially when there was less access to hospitals and uh, you know medical care and so so on and so forth. Um, you you know things to build the blood, things to remove mucus out of the system, and so on and so forth. So all of those things in my in my grandmother's yard. There was uh, persimmons and pomegranates and figs and pecans and all of that. And she didn't even her she didn't even have a yard. I mean, it was just a minimal amount of space. But people historically were growing the things to keep the things close to them that they needed for health and and wellness. And um, those are, that's one of the things that we want to be able to um, share with with our young people. Um, I don't know whether or not I agree with Tim in the fact that um, growing food is not necessarily a necessity. I think it is. We're getting back to that point where it is a necessity. If you pay $9 for a cabbage, <laughs> I mean, come on, man. If you pay $9 for something that we grew up paying 10, 29 cents for, that is, I think that that is, um, it's a necessity. Um, I think that it, it is a necessity because we don't know um, where our foods are coming from. We don't know what people are putting in the foods. It is not uh, reasonable for food to have to come from so far away. Uh, we're not eating seasonally um, and those types of things. So I think that there, there is a necessity for food to be grown in those historic, in those historic ways. Um, so I'm going to, I want, is there any, are there any questions? Yes, ma'am. What was your history of gardening before you started the garden? You know, it, I, I thought about it as punitive when I was growing up. <laughs> <laughs> it, 
it was punitive. It was like, y'all are going to go out here and y'all going to plant this garden. My grandmother would sit in the middle of her garden, uh, uh, middle of our garden on a stump with a switch. <laughs> and, if you, and if you missed a weed or something, she would be tapping you with that switch. Get that over there. Get that over there. You know, it was not a, it was not a fun thing. And so like Tim, I thought, I'm not doing this no more. I will never do this again. Um, it, it, it was so punitive almost to me that, you know, you couldn't even really enjoy the food. You're just like, yeah, the corn is good, but I had to take a beating. For <laughs> I had to take a beating for this stuff, and so I really don't want to do it. Um, so it, it was that thing. I remember watching people um, labor over things, um, and it seemed very oppressive to me growing up. Um, and I just thank God that I've lived long enough to kind of do that 360 and realize how important, how important it is. For many of us, it represented poverty. If you had to grow your own, it was because you couldn't afford to buy it. Because as I was growing up, we were coming into this hyper consumer, you know, this consumerism, this, dr uh, this drive to have more and consume more and to be more and that kind of stuff. Uh, and, to, and, and that meant that we were um, honoring our uh, elders because we were able to do more and have more, consume more than they, they had. Um, and I mean, that's, that's what this, this society thrives on. It thrives on us believing that. Um, so it was a punitive thing. And so for it to be my peaceful place now, it's just a testament to, you know, the power of growing up in the Gullah Geechee community and growing up in that area. Yeah. So any questions about, so we grow on tomatoes now. I've got onions in the ground. I'm trying to wait to put my okra in the ground. I've got sorghum in the ground. Um, I grow a lot of things that are Asian just in honor of my daughter because she loves all things Asian. I try to grow things in different colors and different patterns, different shapes, different fragrances so when the kids come out they can see all of these different things, not just the traditional. Um, I like to grow things that grow in an odd way that they wouldn't, you know, uh, Brussels sprouts are amazing for them to look at how Brussels sprouts grow. Um, I planted this thing called a Japanese winged bean. It looks like some anime, you know, beginning of some anime embryo or something. And the kids abs absolutely love it because it just has this weird look, uh, look to it. Um, the, the Japanese long beans are phenomenal. They taste wonderful. They are, some of them are longer than this. And the kids just absolutely love to watch them drip off of the, the vines, they love that stuff. They absolutely adore the sunflowers. Um, because of COVID, we had a lot of um, high school students that came into the garden to take their senior pictures because that whole experience was lost for them. So they just wanted to put on their cap and gown and just snap pictures of themselves by these big massive sunflowers because they didn't get a chance to have that experience because of COVID. Um, we have used the garden as an outside learning space during COVID, especially with Freedom Readers children. Instead of going inside, they were able to come outside. We taught um, uh, curriculum on abundance using sunflowers. We taught curriculum on um, what a trellis does um, using bamboo uh, from Jim Fitch's yard. I go cut uh, uh, bamboo from Jim Fitch and we taught them about what a trellis is. All a trellis is is a thing that supports the plant as it grows. Just like your parents, just like your mentors, just like your education all support you as you grow. So it's a wonderful, they learned, uh, w we had worms brought in one time and the kids were able to, they about killed, they harassed those worms <laughs> so bad. But they were able to, you know, play with worms. They're able to get their, uh, you know, their hands dirty. They're able to see the difference of when you water something correctly and when you don't. Um, so it's a wonderful, just natural place for, for you to teach young people about nature and, 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 and what it does. Yes, ma'am. Do, is this part of the school program that they come to you or is it after yeah. school? It's getting diff more difficult to, go, to, be, to connect with the school systems. Um, so most of the time we work with after school programs. So Freedom Readers is an after school literacy program um, that had its, had its house at uh, Arnett. So they 
go to uh, Freedom Readers goes to churches, because churches, no matter who your kids are, churches are familiar. Everybody knows the churches, whether they go to those churches or not. So um, we connected with those. Um, we've also worked with Carolina Human Reinvestment, even though they have this huge garden in Pauly's, a lot of the kids that Gianni works with are from the Housing Authority, right across the street from us. So we've had them come in. Um, we've had church groups come in. We've had homeschoolers, uh, people who homeschool their children. But it's really, I'm not built for jumping through bureaucratic hoops and things like that. And working with the school system, it really, it really is kind of complicated. But we get the kids in the after school kind of realm. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to read something to you guys in Gullah that's going to help kind of, ex I hope, help explain why we do the work that we do. So um, the name of this poem, I, I write poems for my daughter, even though she's almost 30 years old. I write poems for her in Gullah because I want her to be connected to the culture through the language. Okay. So the name of this poem is called Big Mama Rap. Big Mama Rap, okay? When Big Mama bend the wrap up she head, a baby gal been to stretch across the floor. He been to study everything way Big Mama do and try for figure how he know way no. Baby gal been to think real hard, cause Big Mama been to learn him so much a thing. He try hard for member all way Big Mama say till he little years been to twitch in the ring. Stick to on a walk. Don't give up to the last. Scribe for do better, and mind he learn from he past. All they be is love, but don't act nobody fool. Trust in the Lord, that big mama fuss rule. That baby girl been to know in the little heart that the big mama do love she for sure. He watched big mama wind the cloth round he head, and he mouth spread as wide as the door. Cause she been to the end as she figure. She ain't have a tank and figure no more. Big Mama take the cloth and wrap e learning in a mara. That's how she know what she know. So when my daughter, so when my daughter was little, my mother used to wrap her head with seven yards of fabric. She make this huge tur turban with seven yards of fabric. And when my daughter was little, my mom would be in the bathroom wrapping her head, and my daughter would stretch across the floor just to watch my mom wrap. That, that head wrap. It would take her about 15 minutes. It was this real intricate thing. And so my daughter, one day, she came running to me after she watched my mama, and she said, I know why Grammy's so smart. I know why she knows everything. And I said, why? She said, because she takes that head wrap and she wraps everything and holds it in her brain. <laughs> That's how she holds on to all that knowledge. And I looked at her, and I was like, you are absolutely right. <laughs> That's exactly how she does it. So stick the under walk. Don't give up to the last. OK, so the garden teaches me that. You've got to stick to the work. You have to keep it going. Whether you feel good or don't feel good, you can't miss any steps. You have to stick to the work. And you have to keep going until you are done. OK, scribe for do better. And mine, learn from your past. So every year, we've got to amend that soil. Every year, we got to do different things to make the plants grow. And I have to learn from last year. So if I messed up something last year and I didn't, it didn't do the right thing last year, I'll call Tim and say, well, Tim, what, what did I do wrong? Or what do I have to do, you know, what do I have to do now? But it's a constant thing. All there be is love. But don't act nobody fool, OK? So you can, they can come. They can watch you, they can learn from you, they can even receive things from you, but you can't go overdue. You know, you, you love people, you love the activity, okay? But people, you can't go, you can't go overboard, okay? Trust in the Lord. That big mama first rule, that's my mother's first rule, to trust in the Lord, okay? So if, if nothing teaches you to trust in God, gardening does that, okay? Because you do everything that you can do, you do everything that you know to do, and then God meets you right there and takes it over, and the miracle actually happens. I don't have a clue 
you know, how that little seed is engineered, you know, to burrow itself out of the ground and become what it becomes, that ain't got nothing to do with me. That's all, that's all him. But you got to meet, you got to get to that point, finish your work, and God will meet you there, and you trust in that process, you will eat. You, you, will, you will eat. So we want to try to preserve those parts of our history and bring those back to our um, young people so that they don't feel helpless as things are changing. You don't have to be helpless. You know, that, t that time you take worry and put that seed in the ground, man, you can have to, you can have a salad. You might not be able to afford to eat no meat, but you will have everything you need, you know. So we want to go back to this history of um, not necessarily that struggle survival, you know, but that survival, that you can be responsible for your own survival and your own health and your own wellness. And these are some of the things that you could do. It's simple, it's easy, but it's hard. It's not that easy. I mean, it's, it's, not, that, it's not rocket science to put that seed in the ground and to, 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 to nurture it. Uh, sometimes your back be hurting, you know what I'm saying? Your hips hurt or whatever the case may be, so it's not easy, but it's a possible thing, okay? So that's what we want to, for people to know. Um, thank you, I'm gonna have to thank Tim in public for being my master gardener. It has been a pleasure. I, you know, for me to send him pictures of these big old ugly bugs and say, Tim, what is this that's eating my stuff? Or, you know, why is this not performing the way it's supposed to? Him coming by and reminding me that I have to do this or that or don't forget to do this or that has truly been a blessing to our mission. So I appreciate that so much. Yes, ma'am. Okay, um, my eyes, when I before I got here, my eyes were like a lens and the two uh, images I yeah. <laughs> and uh, when I came, was doing research here, and was coming here to do research and do whatever. Yeah. Go back to Columbia. Yeah. I remember meeting you. Uh, I don't even know what the interview was. Who I was working for. But I remember you being a community developer. I'm, I, okay. You were helping young people and everything. Okay. And then, honestly, when I came back, it took me a minute to get a job because no one could understand. Yeah. Me. Yeah. It yeah. Took a yeah. Yeah. And guess who helped me to get a job? Was but yeah. let's go over here, Tim. I would get up early in the morning and I would walk to Front Street. And every time I walked to Front Street, I would see Tim. And Tim is actually the, the to Front Street guard. Uh, well, how did you describe yourself? You were the city. Well, I was the uh, public works guy, right? Yeah, but you were building guard. Yeah, I did the uh, park. Yeah, the park. And so every day I got up and I would see Tim, and then I see these beautiful gardens in the Hamilton. I see these beautiful gardens. So these, thank you all for. Well, thank you. So, thank you. So 900 Merriman Road is where Arna AME Church is. The garden is right next to that, across from the Housing Authority. So um, we, we, our intention is to grow food. Um, if you, you, if you want something. If you need something, if you know someone who needs something, when stuff starts to grow, you are welcome. It doesn't have to do with need. It doesn't have to do with if you're, you know what I'm saying? But if you know somebody who is in need of food or if you just want something, you are welcome to come. If you see my tundra out there, my silver tundra out there, you are welcome to come and, and partake. That's what it's, it's, that's what it's for. If you just want to visit. Yeah, now, oh yeah, I forgot. If you want to come and help weed, yeah, if you want to come help weed, <laughs> if you want to come help hoe or any of that stuff, um, I am usually there. I am not a morning, I'm not a daytime gardener. I'm an evening um, gardener, m more so because I'm hot flashing real bad right now and I can't do the, the, the sun like I used to. So I'm usually in the gardens almost every day after 3 o'clock. You'll see, my, you'll see my tundra out there. So, and you're welcome. You're welcome. You don't have to hoe and weed if you don't want to, but you, you are welcome to come and visit. Okay, and anybody's welcome to come and visit. Um, and ask whatever questions. I'll be glad to be helpful, but I'll say call Tim. He's the one who knows all that stuff. All right, any other questions? 
Thank you guys so much.